Welcome, everyone. I would like to share an interesting research I've done about the cycles of Uranus and Neptune and how, in this particular case, they're immediately linked to the communist movement, as well as modern Russia. So now, since Russia is in the news with this terrible, tragic war raging in Europe, I thought it was relevant to explore uh, historical development, but also to learn astrology you know, through that, because what I'm going to demonstrate is that when planets, when we identify cycles of planets, we can see recurrences. Each time these planets form an aspect, there is an event that is triggered. So we start from the conjunction. And just like we look at the phases of the moon and we see, you know, the, the dark moon when it's a new moon, and then gradually as it as the moon moves faster than the sun, it reflects more and more the light of the sun. Um, we, we can apply this principle and phasal development to all the other planets. So we're going to uh, use this example of the communist movement and the USSR and modern Russia with the development of Uranus Neptune. Why this? Because it's, it's going to illustrate those dynamics so beautifully and like I said, it may be relevant to understand our current situation. Um, before we get started, a few advertisement words. First of all, please, uh, I would really appreciate if you can subscribe to this channel. If you're not yet subscribed, it helps support me in creating free content for you guys. So, that would be also an opportunity to get updates when I post new videos. I'm gonna speak about Uranus and Neptune and a lot of these concepts have been <clears throat> um, illustrated and, and written about in my book on Neptune and the 12th house. So it, it's really recommended to go deeper into this archetype and understand there's so much to it the subtitle is called The Timelessness of Truth, which we are going to better understand perhaps through this study. My other book, Astrology and the Evolution of Consciousness, Volume 1, covers the fundamentals of astrology. And there is a whole chapter on the moon in each house and sign, the sun in each house and sign, and then a whole section on the development of the soul on an evolutionary level, how two people born with the same chart, twins, will not necessarily have the same life because they can be on different levels of evolution. So that's not your typical uh, astrology cookbook. And uh, there's a lot to it. It goes very deep, highly recommend it. Another thing I would like to really invite you to consider is the conference we're having uh, in September at Omega Institute, upstate New York. So it's the really the best season to be in upstate New York. Omega is this incredible retreat center where some of the luminaries of the world, you know, the Dalai Lamas and the Deepak Chopras and many great teachers have and are continuing to teach. So it's a really, it's a real privilege to have astrology so prominently uh, presented there, but for us to be there. And so the theme is heart centeredness in the stars. We are going to focus on relationship Venus theme. Ariel Goodman is going to speak about the Venus cycle and how 
the Venus star point is shifting at the end of this year for the first time, I believe in a century, where Venus is gonna, the star point is gonna shift from Scorpio to Libra. And so she is an expert in understanding the complexity of the Venus cycle. Um, Magali is going to lead a ceremony. So about healing, about consciousness and the stars. So we're not only going to take, you know, engage the left brain and take notes and listen to lectures, but also come together as a community uh, and connect with the stars through ceremonial work. Um, the, you know, it's very appropriate for this year's Jupiter-Neptune conjunction theme. Um, and the other great thing about this conference is that it's a one-track conference. So every, the whole audience is in one room and we can be more personal with each other, connect uh, more personally. And, and so this work with the ceremony is really uh, a highlight. And of course, myself, Kay Taylor, Ann Ortley, we have wonderful material to share with you. Um, I invite you to go to the website, Omega's website, and explore the full program. You'll see all the lectures and the schedule. Just Google Omega Institute Astrology Conference 2022 and you'll get there. So to our study, um, as mentioned, I'm going to focus on the Uranus-Neptune cycle. And then I'm also going to touch on the series Sun and series nodes cycle. Why series? Well, interestingly, look at the symbol of the Soviet Union, the hammer and the sickle. And it's very much the series mother of agriculture uh, symbolism. And it happens to be that series is prominent in the charts and the transit uh, reflecting the development, the milestones of the communist movement, Marxist movement. Now, why Uranus and Neptune? Think about, um, you know, what they represent. Uranus represents how we developed our brain, how we perform research in order to find solutions to all societies and survival problems and quandaries. So Uranus is looking both at the telescopes and the microscopes to find, to decode the riddles. And as we keep observing, analyzing, learning, our brain develops and we develop awareness. That awareness can be about physical things, emotional things, spiritual things. So we have the development of technology, the development of science, and the development of spirituality. So Uranus is very much about how we as individuals, as a community, as, a, as humanity, how we become more aware. And, and through awareness, can elevate the quality of life, you know, uh, better sanitary conditions, better health system, uh, more fair judgment, elevate civilization. Um, instead of going to war, be able to conduct healthy debates and resolve differences through um, higher understanding. So Uranus is really about what makes us human. In the positive sense of the word, it is how to move away from primal drives, not to be <clears throat> enslaved by our primal drive and be able to objectify 
um, take a deep breath, look at things more objectively, not get sucked into drama. So very much so, um, Uranus represents the future, how we build a better future as we research and find solutions and elevate quality standards of living. Neptune, on the other hand, represents the original code of life. You know, the things that are always true, no matter where you are or when you live, whatever culture you're in, you know, whether you live in Asia or whether you live in the 18th century or first century, these principles that are universal, you, the term universal is Neptunian. Neptune represents what is true to everyone. You know, we all need love. We all want to be healthy. Even if you're a cat or you're a tree or you're a modern human, <clears throat> you want to be healthy. You want to be happy. You want to be loved and, and loved back. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Neptune represents those core principles that govern everything and also are common to everyone. So it dissolves differences, skin color, political ideals. It makes us homogenous. Um, and because Neptune reminds us that we come from the same source. So there's that collective unification, global perspective, bird eye view about Neptune where but like I said, it, it's about applying principles that are true for everyone at all times. This is why Neptune represents the need to go beyond time, to transcend time and space. The <clears throat> subtitle of my book, The Timelessness of Truth. You know, the truth is the only constant. What's the truth? You know, what really happened? Why are we really here? Where are we all going? You know, what is the unifying principle of our existence? It's eternal. It, it doesn't change with time. There's obviously relative truth. You know, if you are in uh, the rainforest, you're gonna have a different climate, you're gonna perceive things differently than if you are in the Arctic. But even in those different climates and different environments, there is an underlying truth that you wanna be healthy, that you wanna be happy, that you wanna be loved, and you want justice and better quality of life. So, <clears throat> um, when we speak about you know, an example, an illustration of Neptune and Uranus. You see the Uranian principle is about the future, how we keep advancing. And this image is obviously very futuristic, sci-fi, but the true meaning of Uranus doesn't have to translate into modern technology and utope, you know, super uh, advanced technology. Technology is one aspect of Uranus. Science is another aspect of Uranus. Um, you can have a spiritual application, an emotional application of Uranus, where you learn, like we say, to, um, to connect our civilization with nature, to live more harmoniously, with nature. That is also a principle of progress, of awareness, of greater uh, quality of life. So whatever we perceive as progressive changes according to where we're at in each moment. But I think this image kind of illustrates what Uranus is about in that um, it's already thinking about the future. The future is the present. The present is already the past. 
<clears throat> and Uranus has to do with the development of our brain, how you know new thoughts, new realization, new research creates new pathways. On the other hand, Neptune represents those core principles, the, you know, the, the raw, the untamed, the primal, what we, you know, the original core principles of life that are inspiring us to be. <clears throat> so, you know, we all need water, we all need food, we all need sunlight, we all need oxygen, and it's all free. Like nobody can buy or sell us oxygen. Neptune represents what is universal. So what cannot be owned? You cannot own sunlight. You cannot own oxygen just yet. Another illustration to understand those dichotomies, um, again, a very stereotypical illustration of Uranus skyscrapers and um, virtual technology, very high-tech gadget, you know. But Uranus, again, doesn't have to be a concrete jungle only or uh, sky rockets. It can also be any kind of revelation and ideal that advances humanity. But it also, you know, it also captures the complexity. What I wanted to bring in this image is the complexity of the layers of how our brain develops also means that we go faster, we go more places, and we build system upon system, just like our computer, you know, are now reduced to a, an iPhone. And, and it can do so much in so little time and so little space. That's a Uranian paradigm. Faster, farther, and less resources. Now, Neptune, on the other hand, is when we stop inventing, when we stop intervening, the principle of non intervention. Uh, Neptune says, the more you touch, the more you damage. Just, just don't change anything. Keep things simple, keep things as they are. Accept what is. Uranus says, no, we need to find solutions. Let's find a cure for cancer. Let's explore other planets. Let's. Neptune says, there are higher forces at play. There is a higher intelligence. And let it do its work. So what we see here is nature reclaiming a building once it's abandoned. So na nature always has a, you know, the last word and it's going to compost, digest this whole structure. And you see that the dogs, you know, the engineer manufactured dog with the flat nose and the pretty hair. Um, Whereas the other dog is kind of neglected, full of fleas, um, a bit malnourished, but the way it is in the wild, it's untamed, it's not manicured, it's not processed, it's simple. And you may say, well, I prefer this one or I prefer that one. But the truth is we need both. And life works in balance. So if you're too much in the Neptunian realm, you're, you are going to be very passive and you're not going to take care of your life. You're going to expect things to just happen on their own. Whereas if you are in the Uranian principle, then you are um, constantly in your mind and constantly analyzing and in a way complicating your life perhaps. So when we're speaking about the cycle of Uranus and Neptune, we're talking about the cycle between science and spirituality. Science is humans developing their knowledge and developing their sovereignty. Spirituality is humans accepting a higher force. 
surrendering to a higher principle. So you see how these two forces are completely different in their way of operation. And yet, when they work together as a cycle, what unites Uranus and Neptune is idealism. Um, and collective consciousness. Both Uranus and Neptune work on a collective level. They're not detail-oriented. They're not personal. So it's about the big picture perspective. It's about looking at the whole of humanity, not each person one by one. Um, how do we improve you know, the, the human rights for everyone? How do we make sure that every kid goes to school? How do we make sure that um, we elevate standards collectively? So while Uranus works on community and, and progress, Neptune speaks about distribution to the whole. Uh, you know, everyone needs to have access to the resources. Um, you, you know, Uranus, Neptune can also mean the, the need to understand that we are part of nature, that we are, that trees are conscious, that animals are conscious, that not only human doesn't, humans are not above nature, as this image depicts. So when they come together, there is a need to find a better solution for everyone. That's the idealism, the need to find a cure for not just cancer or not just uh, unemployment, a cure for pain. And they each connect together to, to find a solution for pain on a global level, not individual. So when people are born with Uranus Neptune, they, they can understand the big picture. They can operate on a larger scale. Um, if they have other planets in Cancer or the more personal signs, then it, they're gonna bring that to a more intimate place. But otherwise, um, it's, it's about creating systems and we know that the communist Marxist manifesto was about the distribution of resources to the whole. So this is where this idea originates um, in, in this movement. You know, the founder, Marx and Engels, who wrote the Marxist Communist Manifesto um, had, you know, re responded to the abuse of resources, the, the bourgeoisie and the social classes enslaving the uh, proletariat, which is the working class. So they, you know, Th this whole manifesto was about a fair, equal distribution of resources. And this was adopted by Lenin later on to, uh, to build a, a, a new society in, in the Soviet Union, in Russia, um, for collective ownership. You know, communism is the opposite of individuality. So communism is about every person sharing resources. No one is working for the self. There's only a collective ideal. And if you don't subscribe to that ideal, you're a traitor. You are ostracized. So there's a lot of peer pressure to belong to the ideal movement, to be part of this revolution, to save the world. And again, if you're not subscribing, if you're not cooperating with the whole, you become selfish, you become um, a saboteur, and you are eventually 
persecuted or just ejected. Capitalism, on the other hand, is the glorification of individuality. You know, it's the solar energy. How am I going to work hard uh, to be able to achieve more? My personal ambition, how far can I go? So it's all a fire principle, personal, my individuality. What am I, the meanings and the capacity that I can generate personally? So these are opposite systems and they each you know, think that they have all the answers when in fact, as it is with everything, uh, the, the truth is in the middle way. If you are you know, a Marxist communist and you only um, you know, should serve the collective cause at the expense of sacrificing yourself or denying your own needs, and your own individuality, and everything has to be homogenous. Everyone has to, you know, have the same car and share the same car, or wear the same clothes. You deny individuality. It's not natural, <laughs> and that's what happened in the Soviet Union: is an oppression of personal of freedoms. On the other hand, in in the United States, you know, the advancement of capitalism is the overglorification of freedom to the point where we are blinded to the collective need. You know, when we privatize uh, prisons or social services or healthcare to maximize personal gain, um, many a lot of harm is done because priorities are distorted. But on the other hand, if we come to the United States, we see this spirit of entrepreneurship, immense creativity and individual motivation. There's so much that is being done and there's such a creative spirit, but the shadow side is when you're not at your prime, when you get old, when you have an injury, you become nothing because it's all about individuality. The social network, social support system is not prioritized. So as we said, very likely, you know, the balance is between the extremes, but Uranus, Neptune together, represent the global and collective perspective, uh, which is highlighted in the ideal of equally sharing resources, not owning personally and um, directing any ambitious drive towards collective goals. So let's begin with the beginning. Here we have the chart of the, you know, the catalyst for all this, Karl Marx, who is born under the conjunction of Uranus Neptune. Right as, you know, the cycle is about to begin. He's also born on an eclipse in Taurus. Interestingly, you know, this vast, conceptual ideals of communism, um, his whole manifesto, you know, philosophizing about a, an ultimate solution to advanced civilization was channeled through economy, resource management, and, you know, the whole thing about ownership. So you see how that eclipse in Taurus was the channel of the Uranus-Neptune vision, utopian vision. So an idealist, a philosopher, a great thinker, you know, Neptune-Uranus, higher mind, eclipse in Taurus, belly, let's bring this, these vast concept to survival needs, how we're gonna make money, how we're gonna distribute money, how we're gonna eat, and 
how are we going to find sustainability, Taurus? His partner, uh, Frederick Engels, who supported him financially and was, uh, you know, laid the groundwork for Marx's writing, is also born during the Uranus-Neptune conjunction. They're born two years apart. The exact conjunction was in 1822 at three Capricorn. So Marx was born in 1818 and Engels was born in 1820, closer to the actual conjunction. And you see that even though it's not an exact conjunction, the fact that it's within orb, you know, is a seeding moment. So I, I want, it's another astrology lesson is, you know, it's, they're not ending a cycle. They're beginning a new cycle. This is a conjunction, even if it's balsamic technically. Now, interestingly, you'll see that Marx has all his planets in the Eastern hemisphere between the 10th house <clears throat> and the third house mostly. And Angles is the opposite, has most of the planets between the fourth and the ninth. So it's another interesting study how we meet people that complement us. Um, Angle is also born with the moon on the, on the nodes, but it's not an eclipse because the sun is not there. So it's a mini eclipse and it's in the second house, which also relates to Taurus and resources. So both have this earth moon, second house moon on the nodes. And they both want to change, you know, revolutionize the economy. An economic system. A lot to dissect here, um, but let's move forward. Now, this is the conjunction. They they are the seeding people. Um, th then we look at how Uranus starts to move away from Neptune. So Neptune is the slower moving planet. And like the phases of the moon, as the moon separates from the sun, it gains more light, it's waxing until the full moon, then it's waning until the new moon. So we apply this same phasal principle to these planets. And we see that in a way, Uranus now is at a 45 degree angle from Neptune, waxing, moving away from Neptune, and because it's forming an aspect, we have an activation. And so this is the first publication of the manifesto when Karl Marx actually uh, publishes it for the first time. It wasn't very popular just yet. So it was kind of a first effort. Um, it, you know, it's still in the growing pain phase. Interestingly, as we move from the semi-square to the actual square, your Neptune is in Aries, square Uranus in Cancer on the nodes. And Lenin happens to be born during the square. Now, what is a square? A square is about bringing a new concept into our security. Aries new cancer security. So how do I apply new ideals into an existing framework? So it's called crisis in action. How do we take action to implement the things we want to implement and challenge our own security needs as we do that? And Lenin, we know, um, was the leader of the Bolshevik revolution in Russia, toppling the monarchy, the elite, the bourgeoisie, to establish a communist paradigm. And um, basically a society that would be uh, driven by collective ideals of 
not non-ownership and work for the collective. Interestingly, Lenin is born not only with that square, but with Mars exactly squaring the nodes in Aries. So he was spearheading that he fought the revolution. You know, we see an active physical force, a warrior. Interestingly, a Taurus as well, with Mercury exactly on Karl Marx's eclipse degree. So we can understand how they are both born with the Jupiter Neptune. Uh, Uranus Neptune cycle, one conjunction, and the other one is the square, and both are Tauruses. And the moon is also on the nodes. So, once again, the conceptual idea of the Marxist manifesto applied to a Taurian context of distribution of resources, sustainability, and so forth. Interestingly, uh, that's the eclipse right after uh, Lenin was born, postnatal. And that eclipse is in Cancer, conjunct the sickle series. And of course, uh, the square is still there, and it's almost exact a couple of months later. We look at eclipses around birth, either before birth or after birth, as key indicators of the cycles we are going to activate in our lives. Now, <clears throat> the Tsar, Nikolai the second Romanov, so the, the Tsar who is the monarch um, is born around that time as well. So as Lenin is born in 1870, the Tsar is born in 1868, two years apart. So you see these pairs of people born during this time. You have Marx and Engels born during the conjunction. Then you have um, Lenin and the Tsar, who are going to be opponents, born during the square. Now, I have a double wheel here um, with the chart of the eventual execution. We're going to get to it later. Let's just first look at the Tsar's natal. He's born under the square, as mentioned. So a first quarter square. And interestingly, his son at 27 Taurus is the midpoint between Uranus and Neptune, one degree orb. How incredible that is. Another interesting fact is that he's born with Ceres on the south node. Mysterious Ceres keeps showing up in all kinds of weird way, and we'll see how it gets more and more intriguing. The chart of the execution has Ceres conjunct the North Node. So he's born with Ceres on the South Node. He dies with Ceres on the North Node. Interesting. Interesting also to see Uranus transit on series. We're going to come back to this chart eventually. The second edition of the manifesto is published two years after the Tsar is born and Lenin are born in 1872. And that becomes the popular version of the Marxist Communist Manifesto. And here again, we see <clears throat> Neptune square Uranus involved in a grand cross with Saturn, Jupiter, and the moon. So 
Jupiter helps the publication. It spreads the word, you know, to all horizon. And, and that gains traction, interest, and people are starting to resonate more and more with this doctrine. Interestingly, you know, during those times, um, leaders in Russia uh, already started to move away to separate church from state. So the whole Marxist ideal was not only the distribution of resources, but there was a spiritual transformation, even crisis, where you remember I mentioned that Uranus represents science and Neptune represents spirituality. And part of the communist manifesto is that spirituality and religion are used to manipulate the weaker classes. So there is a glorification of the Uranian principle of mental development, advancement of science, advancement of civilization at the detriment of spirituality, religion. So there's a war also happening between Uranus and Neptune. On the other hand, Neptune also works in this manifesto by dissolving the Uranian elitism. So the Communist Manifesto speaks about power to the people, and you know, at least in theory, <clears throat> um, power to the collective more appropriately. And Neptune represents the collective. So Neptune is also waging a war against Uranus. And Neptune says, whatever resources you have, whatever ideas you have, you need to share them with everybody. And this is why so many geniuses, so much technology was creatively developed, you know, under the communist era. The sciences really boosted, the, the level of academic um, uh, learning was really ahead. So you see how Uranus and Neptune were represented in these different aspects of the culture. It was also very equalitarian for, between gender. You know, women were working in the Soviet Union. They were part of the labor force. There was no discrimination in, and not as much at least. <coughs> and emphasis on research, research. It, 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 eventually, you know, the Russians, the Soviets were the first one to have a man in space. You know, it happened before the Americans and before the rest of the world because the emphasis is on the ideal of science. So back to this, you know, the second manifesto and everything is happening around those years. The key figures born then, Lenin and the Tsar and the second manifesto all birthed around that. Time. Another key figure, Stalin is born a few years later, 1878. And he is born with Neptune trying Uranus. So you see how Uranus continues his journey away from Neptune, from a semi-square to a square. Now it's a trine. And here is Stalin, the dictator per se, uh, born under this trine in earth signs. In the second house, if we can rely on that time of birth, it's speculative. It's actually a noon chart, so we don't know what time it is, probably. Um, but still in Taurus, and you know, the working force, Virgo, the resources, uh, Neptune, and being himself, you know, a Sag sun with the sun square. Saturn, 
you know, he meant business. And Jupiter on his north node in Aquarius, the vision above all. You know, you see this Uranus Neptune trine and the Jupiter in Aquarius on the North Node that basically says individuals don't matter. The vision is more important than the person. And that's why he was not intimidated and afraid to sacrifice people. And, you know, any opposition to begin with was destroyed, but he also sent people to war to and and you know there was tremendous amount of purging and killing to sustain his Sagittarian Jupiterian Neptune Uranus lofty conceptual vision. Now you add a Mars in Scorpio opposing Pluto, and violence is justified. Trotsky, another pair, Trotsky and Lenin, uh, excuse me, Stalin and Trotsky were the two contenders to succeed Lenin. When Lenin, you know, spearheaded the revolution, he established the Soviet uh, constitution and union, and then he paired, he died two years later. So the successors were Stalin and Trotsky, born a year apart. So you see how these pairing of souls come together as allies or enemies. Trotsky is therefore also of the Neptune-Uranus trine. Neptune um, is opposing his son in Scorpio. And instead of having a Mars-Pluto opposition, as Stalin has, he has the conjunction. Here, we also see Ceres square Sun. And I believe that Stalin had series trine sun. So this is gaining traction. The series becomes more and more important. What ended up happening is, you know, during the time of the transition when Lenin dies is eventually Stalin was the bully and he, even though Lenin didn't want him to be the successor, Stalin just devoured everyone and paved his way to leadership and Trotsky had to be exiled. I'm not going to talk about that. So that was in 1879, the trine. And then what happened is that there's a revolution in 1905. People are rising up against the Tsar because he's just not, he's corrupt. He's not managing, you know, the Russian empire um, fairly equally and people are fed up. So there's the first revolts and revolution and reaction and asking for change. Eventually against his will, the Tsar establishes a new Russian constitution during the exact opposition. Look at that. Uranus, Neptune are now opposite. And we have the first activation of the original principles. So Karl Marx published the first manifesto during the first quarter square. The second manifesto Where is it? In the first square. So this is all in writing. It's all, it's all still, you know, 
ideas being published. But here, there's a, there's a fuller effect. It's, it's, it's causing an action. People are actually revolting. So it's not theory. It's not just a book to read anymore. It is a reality, full phase, opposition. And a need for change. During you know, the new constitution, hmm, the sun is square the nodes with Ceres. You may say, well, it's too wide, but you'll see it's not. So the constitution happens with the sun at 14 Taurus conjunct widely series. Now, the actual October revolution, where they are not just asking for change, they are storming the palace, forcing the Tsar to step down. And the Bolshevik, the Marxists are taking over. The Sun series exact conjunction at 14 Scorpio, the opposite degree of the new Russian constitution. So you see a com another kind of full moon opposition effect, Sun series in Taurus, Sun series in Scorpio. During that time, the opposition between Neptune and Uranus is still on, but widening. So it's a 167, 68 angle. Some refer to that as a Queen de Chile, as Noel Till would say, but it's also within the realm of an opposition. Here, Saturn is also involved in opposition with Uranus. Saturn in Leo, monarchy, Uranus in Aquarius, the revolution, toppling the authority, the monarch, and, you know, in, in the idea of bringing a new progressive, fair uh, conditions to, to the whole. This is when the actual constitution, uh, the actual Soviet Union is established on the 30th of December, 1922. So about um, five years after the actual revolution. So Lenin was spearheading the revolution. He also uh, <clears throat> directly, indirectly ordered the execution of the Tsar and his family. Um, and then he spearheaded the actual Soviet Union, which became the largest country on the planet, covering 11 time zones or something crazy like that. Sun series conjunct. Uranus, Neptune are starting to form an quincunx um, with Mars. So it is not fully established yet. It's not, it's just starting to come within Orm. <clears throat> but then the moon happens to be the exact midpoint between Uranus and Neptune. Interestingly, there's a grand trine between Pluto, Jupiter, and Uranus. Now, Vladimir Lenin dies a couple of years after, um, less than a year and, a, and some after the Soviet Union is established. You know, his work is done, um, and he is. not happy with Stalin. 
he prefer Trotsky to succeed him. Now here at the death, the actual quincunx is in orb. So Uranus, Neptune, quincunx, the quincunx after the full moon, after the opposition, Uranus starts to wane. And you see how <clears throat> the original idea begins to show its cracks. The quincunx shows imperfection, shows a need for repair. And the death of Lenin, you know, paves the way to Stalin to be, you know, the corrupt dictator, ruthless butcher, bully. Um, so the quincunx starts to show this erosion, really um, showing the shadow of this whole ideology. It is also involving Jupiter to add more drama. <clears throat> Ceres is on the south node. Look at that degree, 29 Aquarius conjunct the south node in Pisces. How peculiar that this is the exact signature of the Tsar Nikolai birth chart. So the death of Stalin, excuse me, the death of Lenin parallels the birth of the Tsar. Weird. But clear. <clears throat> so here Stalin expels Trotsky. He says, you know, get out of the way and Trotsky is exiled and eventually, you know, an interesting twist to the story, which we'll see next chart. But here the quincunx between Uranus and Neptune is exact. So you see how the quincunx begins with the Soviet Union and a lot of political intrigues but overall, that's the ideal is established during that um, phase. Then Lenin dies and things really start to go downhill seriously. Um, the whole utopian vision becomes a nightmare. So Stalin takes over and that's the exact Queen Kongs. Frida Kahlo, what does she have to do with any of this? Well, she's the one who hosts Trotsky after his exile. He flies to Mexico in one of his stations and she is a, his supporter. She is herself a political activist and Marxist. And guess what? She's born during the opposition of Uranus, Neptune, uh, conjunct her son, Mars. So she's not just a fabulous painter, but she's a political activist and she's involved in this whole Soviet story by um, helping Trotsky in, in his exile. So you see that even, you know, uh, figures that are not immediately central to the story capture the theme. They, they are part of the Neptune-Uranus story. Gorbachev, born in 31, so she's born in 1907, Gorbachev born in 31. That is three years after Stalin expels Trotsky in 28. Gorbachev is born. And Boris Yeltsin is born, another pair of leaders who are going to be you know strategic in the development of uh, this movement this you know they are going to be those who will dismantle the soviet union and you see again that um uranus and 
you know, Gorbachev is born with Neptune, again, widely Queen Kongs, or it, it's also, re, you know, in this case, it can be referred to as a by septile. Um, a septile is triceptile. A septile is is about 50 plus degrees angle. And so here it's close to that, if I'm not mistaken. But interesting that both of them, you know, again, Uranus on the North Node, the same as <clears throat> Lenin, who was also born with Uranus on the North Node, All right? So Gorbachev, capture that and Ceres on the South Node. Yeltsin is born a month prior to Gorbachev with the same signatures. He's an Aquarius, Gorbachev is a Pisces. And here comes the other Vladimir, Putin, who is now born under the last closing square of Neptune Uranus. Ah, look at that. Vladimir I, Lenin, had Uranus at 18 Cancer. Square Neptune at 19 Aries. And this Vladimir has Uranus at 18 Cancer. <laughs> Square Neptune at 21 Libra. So he knew when to be born. Is he Lenin? You know, some will ask. Is this a reincarnation? It's a, it's can be argued. They have both Jupiter and Taurus. They both have a two degree air moon, same Uranus. Um, so a lot of parallels, but not conclusive. Back to our Uranus-Neptune square, uh, we see how Uranus is basically waning the closing square and Putin is going to experience the transition. He's not in power, but he will be the first, um, not the first president, Yeltsin was the first president, but Putin is going to be uh, the one to lead the modern, modern Russia on the world map. So he will, he will be the symbol of the new era of power for this country. Soon after uh, Vlad Putin is born, uh, sorry for the typo, it should be one T, in 50, October 52, Stalin dies early 53 with the same Uranus-Neptune square. <clears throat> so, um, you see that Putin is born with a Sun series trine. And again, Stalin dies with a Sun series square. The death of Stalin is also the, you know, it's around the time that the Cold War really, you know, 
becomes very central. You know, the Cold War really started after the end of World War II. Um, but that's a turning point. Now, fast forward, the end of the Soviet Union, the new Uranus-Neptune conjunction. So this whole cycle of building, or of having an ideology, writing about it, fighting for it, implementing it, then showing the cracks, seeing its decline and misuse, and eventually collapsing to rebuild a new version for the next conjunction. This is the, the end of the Soviet Union and the beginning of the modern states, modern state of Russia and Ukraine and Tajikistan and Belarus. And so all the country reclaim their sovereignty during that time. And look what is being conjunct here, the sun and Ceres back together. So we had a sun series at 14 Scorpio during the Bolshevik revolution. Now we see the end of the Soviet Union and new Russia with a sun series in Sagittarius. Not only is Uranus Neptune you know, the formation of this new cycle and the end of an era, but it's on the North Node. So you see how anything, any planet on the North Node becomes central, amplified, karmic, fated. All of this trines Jupiter as well. <clears throat> Putin becomes president after Boris Yeltsin, you know, so you had Gorbachev, who was the leading figure that led to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Then the first president of the new Russia was Yeltsin, but he was weak and dysfunctional. Then Putin, you know, rises from the vacuum when I believe Yeltsin is incapacitated for health reasons. And look at that, he rises to power during the same Neptune-Uranus conjunction, but this time on the South Node. So the Soviet Union collapsed with Uranus-Neptune on the North Node in Capricorn, and Putin comes to power when the Uranus-Neptune is on the South Node. Sun Square Series. Okay, so what next? Where are we at now? You know, you can continue to analyze the Jupiter, excuse me, the Neptune, Uranus cycle and see the next aspect to determine the next milestones in this development. The next time there are going to form an angle is right now. This is the chart for <clears throat> um, May, June, 2022. Neptune is at 25 Pisces, Uranus at 15 um, Taurus. Uranus on the North Node, always significant. Remember that Putin, uh, um, Gorbachev was born with it, Lenin was born with it, so there's probably someone that's going to be an important figure who is born this year with this configuration. What is this aspect? It's a septile. So um, it's 72 degrees. Here it's 70, 
you know, it starts to be within or, but the whole year Uranus and Neptune are gonna be around that 72 degrees angle. So even what we what is considered minor aspects are relevant. And we know that <clears throat> there is something that is being deeply transformed about the country, Russia. Obviously now, you know, the talk is about the Ukraine war and how this affects the supply of gas and oil, Neptune in Pisces, gas and oil, uh, Uranus in Taurus raising prices, you know, um, a lot of turbulence that is superficial. But there's something brewing that is changing the landscape and it's going to change the politics because there's no turning back. What it, however, this war ends, you know, something has changed permanently. It's not going to be to go back to what things were. So there's something set in motion. Um, will Russia be isolated beyond the military conflict? Let's look. This is the chart of Putin with today's transit. Uh, just a, an interesting reflection on the fact that Hygieia, which is an asteroid related to health, is on his ascendant and the North Node is on his Hygieia. Now, I've had many conversation with people who say this is not really his chart. We don't know the time of birth. So it's definitely not a confirmed chart, but based on what we established here, seems like it's pretty a relevant chart and it works pretty accurately. So look at uh, Hygieia on his North Node and many rumors about his health are circulating that he is not well and that he may have cancer of the stomach. So this could confirm that, that there's at least, you know, some health concerns. Um, what is also happening, you know, I talked about that in previous videos. Uh, currently, Mars squares his Mars. Pisces, Neptune squares his Mars. Now, winning a war with Neptune square your Mars, good luck. Neptune dissolves Mars. So wherever your aggression and Mars in Sagittarius, you know, has that ideological justification for a war. Neptune creates a disillusionment effect. Now, it doesn't mean that everyone is bound to win, to lose a war when Neptune is involved with Mars. But it does suggest that if you don't come from a spiritual point of view, um, you're gonna be tested about your intentions. So if you really come to serve, to defend yourself against aggression, you may win the war with Neptune Mars. But if you are the aggressor in an unprovoked, at least on the surface, we know that Russia felt cornered by NATO and you know, we can speak about the political debate, but still on a military level, no one attacked Russia. So that's where the Neptune comes in. Neptune is gonna bring a lot of power to self-defense. So, you know, who knows? Maybe there, you know, Putin did act in self-defense and maybe his justifications are karmically valid. Um, it's not for us to fully, to have a final word about that. And we know we, are, we have our biases. Let's see if Neptune turns in his favor or not. Um, but yeah, um, Neptune, Mars often have this David Goliath 
effect that the underdog, the least expected, is going to uh, show promise, which seems to be the case. Interestingly, um, we are, you know, Mars is moving into Aries, Jupiter is moving into Aries, Chiron is in Aries. They're all going to oppose Putin's Sun, Saturn, Neptune. Not easy. A lot of adversity and danger, potential danger for extreme reactive behavior. So Mars opposition can, you know, can be an act of desperation. It could also mean that there's more aggressive force coming to the ground. Um, it could also be because if it is the sixth house and this chart is reliable, it could also, again, refer back to his health. So, Let me see. The next aspect between Neptune and Uranus is gonna be the sextile. So right now we are in the septile, 72 degrees, right? I'm, I'm, mm, mm, mm. So yeah, it, sorry, it is a 50 septile, 50 degrees, not 72 degrees, delete that. So you count here 25 to 25, 30 degrees and plus 20 degrees, 50 degrees. So we are now in the 50 degree angle, the septile. And at some point, um, we're gonna move to the sextile 60 degrees angle. And interestingly, this happens in 2026 when other outer planets are on the same degree. Pluto at four, Aquarius, Neptune four, Aries, Uranus four, Gemini, and Jupiter four, Leo. I mean, keep this chart in mind because when all slow moving planets align in such a way, there are world changes. You know, it completely transforms culture globally. So this is going to be a period of uh, deep change, socio-political changes. And of course, many, we can expect many, many breakthroughs with Pluto, Uranus, Trine, Neptune, Jupiter, Trine. You, know, you have the technology of Uranus, Aquarius, and you have the... Um, vision of Neptune, Jupiter, extremely global. A lot of things will happen. Like we're going to go to other planets. We're going to be visited by aliens. Whatever it is, it's, it's a game changer. But as far as our uh, Russian paradigm is concerned, this will very likely also shift leadership, policies, structure in modern Russia. The last one that I'm gonna look at is the square. We, we saw how important the square were. So the next square is gonna be in 39. It's, you know, 17 years from now. So we have time to, uh, to go through a lot and a lot of wonder, water under the bridge. Uh, but that's how we want to look at these cycles. So if we want to do predictive work, we understand that figures who are born under this cycle and transits with this cycle can have an effect if they are born in the context of the Russian politics. So obviously, if someone's born in India with a Neptune-Uranus conjunction, it doesn't mean that they will change Russian history. Uh, astrology works with context. However, 
if they are born in that under that umbrella, they can possibly uh, become leading figures and transformative forces, activators. So now I encourage you to use this principle in your own chart, you know, see what kind of planetary cycles you're born under. Is it a Jupiter Saturn? Is it a Jupiter Neptune? Is it a square, an opposition? Always go back to the initial conjunction, just like we saw here. Everything started at the conjunction when Marx was born and angry. Everything ended with the second conjunction in 1990. And you saw how each angle created a step in the evolution of the process. So the same thing with you, if you are born under a specific cycle, track when the conjunction started, then track what angle you're born under and what your role is, <coughs> excuse me. And then keep tracking the future after your birth. What were the aspects? And is, was there a new conjunction? And what happened to you during that time? And how you are going to be affected and you, you're gonna go through milestones each time these two planets form a new angle and progress in their cycle. So this is something you know, that I'm teaching more extensively in my course. You know, it's deep astrology. It really takes you to the soul journey. But as you can understand, it it, my approach is to bring a holistic understanding. You know, we can look at aspects separately and say, well, you're, you know, Putin is born under Uranus, Neptune square. But if, if we don't explore the deeper implications, that it's not only an isolated aspect, it's part of a larger cycle that began before him and continues after him. Then we, you know, we narrow our understanding. So I, I want to encourage you to consider this, this type of study if you are really wanting to take your astrology deeper. You know, we start from the very beginning and we the program prepares you for professional practice um so thank you and again don't forget subscribe to the channel see how good i'm getting at advertising this all the best to everyone and if you watch my previous video remember to pay attention to may 29 Mars Jupiter conjunct in Aries three degrees. Pay attention to that. Thank you very much.